Welcome to the PC Gaming Week Spot, your recap of the last seven days in PC video gaming. My name is Colin Mahern, and joining me this week, uh, he is my weatherman, and I'd blow his billy boy down. It is the one, the only, it's Mr. Matthew Castle. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> that's, that's very powerfully charged sentence. So I, I mean, I've started to try and bring some sort of cultural reference from the previous seven days into your introduction. And to be honest, I'd completely forgotten until about 30 seconds ago. But uh, that's a, a bastardization of that sea shanty that everyone has been singing oh, on, on I social heard media. That. I, I'm aware that some sea shanty thing is happening out in the world, but... Um, You've steered clear. Oh, yeah. I've, I've, you know me. I've not really got much time for bullshit. Yeah, I, I did think that th this is something that Matthew Castle would absolutely despise, which is why I was hoping you had at least seen it once, just to engage it's a little. It's just the Weller man. It's, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's oh, Weller. Yeah. I said weather. Yeah, it's Weller. Yeah, some... Weller. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that that makes a lot more sense. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard it. Uh, when I see Weller man, it makes me think of Slender Man, and I think... I don't really want anything to do with that guy. It makes um, me think of Paul Weller. That's where I, my mind goes. Oh yeah, the OG Weller man. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, sea shanties, big fat, no. Well, no, they're fine, but um, I don't want people doing them to me on Twitter. Um, you know. It just doesn't doesn't interest me at all. I uh, my parents live down in Devon, and they are friends with some very a aging fishermen in the local community. Okay, and they occasionally have gatherings at their house, like parties for you know their friends or whatever. And so they'll have these aging fishermen along, and there'll always come a point in the evening where the aging fishermen start singing songs of the sea. And it becomes like a big communal kind of, you know, sing along mm -hmm. thing. Um, so I don't need smug teenagers doing it on the internet. I got the real thing. I got the real Weller man. Yeah, exactly. Legit sea shanties. That's what you want. Uh, well, you know what? I, I said this last week that nothing was happening in video games. This week, Everything in ha happened in video games. So let's crack on, Matthew. But before we get on to the bigger news stories of the past seven days, I want you to get that crank of yours and open that news gob because I have some information snacks for you. Nom, 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 Info nom, nom, snacks nom, nom, for nom, his gob. <sighs> so, starting off, do you remember our friend from last week, one idle sloth, who was the, the Twitter user who mentioned about Ubisoft Plus on Xbox Game Pass? Well, yeah. they've popped up again, Matthew. Uh, oh, with another impressively vague prediction. Well, this is is, is not, Nintendo going to make another Mario game, perhaps? This was quite exact. Um, okay. They said that they spotted a leaked release date for the Mass Effect Trilogy remaster. Uh, and according to Eurogamer sources, the date that uh, Idle Sloth said, which was the 12th of March, is bang on. Nothing has been confirmed yet, of course. Um, but yeah, maybe we'll be able to play through all those eight games on the 12th of March. Who don't, knows? Um, that's, uh, don't th I don't want that info in my info nugget or whatever you call them in my gob. Info snacks. You don't want anything from Idle Sloth. Oh, I, don't want to, I, don't want, I don't want anything from Idle Sloth in my mouth ever again. I simply do not care. Uh, well, let's see if you care about this, because at CES, uh, oh, which of okay. course we'll be talking about later, but at the end of Sony's keynote, they revealed release windows for a few third-party PS5 games also on PC. So, do you remember Stray, that cat game? Uh, well, that's apparently coming out in October. Kina, Bridge of Spirits, which is a game that you mentioned when we looked forward throughout the year. Mm -hmm. Apparently that will be out in March. And the biggie, Ghostwire Tokyo, is apparently coming in October. Uh, no, we don't know if these dates... Uh, well, first of all, we don't know if they're nailed on, but it was in a Sony presentation, so 
you know, uh, but we don't know if they'll also apply to PC. But again, you would think. Uh, so, yeah. That's you exciting. Know, October. It is. It is. Like we're already halfway through January. October will be here in no time. I no, can't wait to get back. Get this, my boots on. this year is just going to zip along, I have a feeling. Uh, in other release date news, delays. Uh, Riders Republic, which is the next game from the Steep developer, uh, it looks a little bit like Trials, but, I don't know, bigger and more expensive. Uh, that has been delayed until, quote, later this year. And also Hogwarts Legacy has been delayed until 2022. Um in a follow-up to the Harvey Smith talk, IGN reported that the next Arcane Austin game appears to be a fantasy game, according to a LinkedIn profile of a visual effects artist. Um, and IGN in that article made the... Uh, well, they said that, you know, Dishonored could be considered a fantasy game. You shoot magic and stuff. So, mm. could, could be Dishonored 3. Uh, another story which we will go... It'll probably lead headlines on hot takes next week, I'd imagine, unless Phil Spencer, I don't know, fucking does something mad. Uh, Capcom are promoting a Resident Evil showcase. So it's a, a Resi Direct, essentially. Uh, this will happen on Thursday at 10 p.m. our time. And what they've said is that it will include a trailer, some gameplay, and a, quote, guided tour of Resident Evil Village. Some people are even saying that, you know, we might get a glimpse of a Resident Evil 4 um, remake or whatnot. Uh, is is there anything before we obviously, you know, we'll go into it, we'll dissect it next week, but is there anything that you either anticipate or hope for from a Resident Evil Direct? Uh, no, not really. I just, like I said, I've been a bit nervous about the whole werewolf thing that they seem yeah. to be doing with this one. Um, I'll be interested to see how they've kind of, de sort of delivered on that, but you know, I love Resident Evil 7. This seems to be a sort of return to that storyline and that style of game. Yeah. Um, the, like, the, the five seconds of it or whatever it is they've shown do look pretty shiny. Exciting five what, seconds. I want to know what the deal is with grumpy Chris Redfield. Mm. Hopefully we'll find out, get a few, a few morsels uh, this Thursday. And... Mm. This initially started off as like quite a small story and then snowballed, but still. Um, so, <laughs> CD Is this still a snack? <laughs> <laughs> uh, an entree, perhaps. Uh, okay. CD Projekt CEO, Marcin Iwinski, posted, along with CD Projekt, I suppose, posted a five-minute video about uh, Cyberpunk 2077's launch problems. And in the video... He mainly addressed the problems with the console version. However, this did backfire a little bit because the quote that most outlets ran with was this, uh, quote, every change and improvement needed to be tested and as it turned out, every change and improvement needed to be tested and as it turned out, our testing did not show a big part of the issues you experience while playing the game, end quote. Now, this made people very cross because uh, they took it that Iwinski was basically putting all of the blame on QA. But then we had more because over the weekend, Bloomberg ran a story where they had loads of quotes from different CDPR employees. And a few of the things that came from this were one, that employees apparently didn't expect the game to come out until 2022. Uh, two, the 2018 demo that was shown to press was, quote, almost entirely fake, end quote. And three, development didn't begin until 2016, which was four years after the initial announcement. Hmm. Matthew. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in cyberpunk, man. Yeah, I know. On and on and on. Oh, I, I'm, I mean, I said it was the first or second show, I was just like, I'm so sick of cyberpunk. But I'm like, there are certain conversations that need to be had about it, like, you know, yeah, crunch I, and whatever else. Yeah, um, I, I feel like at the core of it is just there, uh, you know, from his big statement, it sounded like a decision should have been made at some point that, you know what, this isn't going to be, this is never going to work on on last gen or what is now last gen yeah. on Xbox one and PS4. Like it just can't be done. And they should have bit the bullet on that. 
and um, they shouldn't have announced it was going to be that, that. I think that's where some of the problems come from. It's like it's just what they said beforehand. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's a it's a real tricky nightmarish one. Like it is, it is because there's just no way. Like they know, and they knew, and whatever they say, it's just that version is so busted. And, you know, the machines just aren't capable of it. And you can put that on the machines or whatever, but it's not. It's your decision to put it on there, you know. And, yeah. Mess. The thing about the demo being fake is a bit awkward, though, because, you know, E3 demos and whatever, you know, vertical slices, mm-hmm. that's the nature of the thing. Like, exactly. And know. I mean, I, I mean, if, if, because maybe there are people watching or listening, like a vertical slice is... Well, it is what it is. It's just this uh, 20, 30 minute section of the game that has been like, you know, tweaked and tuned within an inch of its life. Yeah, polished um, to basically final product quality. Yeah. But also, it's, under, it's understood sh- that like, well, you know, changes up, I, would, I thought were reflected in game. Like, I didn't have them running side by side, but when I was playing it, I was like, oh yeah, it was this. Because I remember after that demo saying to interviewing one of the, um, it was like a mission designer and saying, is that real? Like, or is that just like a proof of concept? Like what's, what's the deal with that? And he was like, no, it's real. You know, that's, that's what the game's going to be and everything. And I, it didn't seem like particularly shifty at the time, but I, you know, I remember thinking, well, that's, uh, you know, it just looked so, fr- you know, there was so much bespoke stuff in it. And in that sequence there is, Actually, like in the game, the, the, the when you go in and save the woman from the bathtub and everything, yeah. you know, some minor details have changed, but it's largely the same. I thought like, so. I think some of the things they said where they're like, you know, or oh, this thing could happen when actually it's a very scripted moment and only happens once. So, you know, there's this thing about um, you can get ambushed by other cars on the road and there's in-car combat or whatever. And it's like that only happens in a very few scripted sequences does happen like that is technically true but it's it's a you know it's a bit vague there's almost like a little touch of the molinies in some of the kind of promises you know you talk about something in a vague enough way and you could say well technically this yeah. is in there but it's not a a big systemic thing yeah i mean look cyberpunk is going to I don't think it's going away anytime soon. That story, oh, thought, so. Oh, I don't know. I, I know it sounds really sort of like entitled to be like, well, it was fine for me and I've played it, but like, I literally don't know what else that, you know, mm. I don't know. They have to fix it for the people it doesn't work for, but, uh, you know, I've seen some people are like, oh, I've played it through and I'm waiting for it to fix it again. And you're like, for what? What do you think is going to change? Like, mm. you've played it now. You've seen the story. It's like quite a, it hasn't got much to it, really, yeah. I don't think. Uh, no, like, I, I agree. I can't see myself ever playing it again. Like, I don't know what... You know, what it, why would you? Like, eh, you know, I just don't why? think it's deep or interesting enough, but... It's, it's um, not, it's not an... It's, uh, I mean, yeah, like, it's, it's not the RPG that they sold, but, oh, you can play, like, play as the street kid, it'll be this game. Play as the nomad, it'll be this game. It's like, no, like, there will be subtle differences, maybe, but it's not... They're not three different games, essentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Matthew, those your information snacks and starter in uh, cyberpunk flavored. Uh, so let's get into the bigger news stories and maybe one that has a, a hint more positivity, perhaps, uh, as we discuss the headlines and hot takes. <laughs> Yes, headlines and hot takes is the part of the PC Gaming Week spot where we indeed discuss the larger news stories of the last week. And dearie me, Matthew. Dearie, dearie me. Indiana Jones! There's going to be an Indiana Jones game who... I, 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 did anyone see this coming? I'm not sure. Uh, so last Tuesday, and annoyingly, about two hours before the last week's episode of the Week Spot went live, uh, Bethesda announced that Wolfenstein developer Machine Games is making an Indiana Jones game. Uh, Bethesda tweeted alongside the announcement, 
A new Indiana Jones game with an original story is in development from our studio Machine Games and will be executive produced by Todd Howard in collaboration with Lucasfilm Games. It'll be some time before we have more to reveal, but we're very excited to share today's news. And I think the day before this announcement, Disney said that they were rebranding the Lucas Games division to simply Lucasfilm Games, which is the original name. And at the time, I thought, and I don't know, I, I I think others did as well, that that would just, you know, that would apply to Star Wars games. Um, but apparently not. There's going, you know, Indiana Jones as well. Now, fans have picked apart the trailer to see if they could spot anything. And they have done whether these, you know, I don't know, they're, they're fan theories. So one... Yeah, if you, um, right at the end, if you look very carefully... Um, you can see his iconic hat and whip. Mm, that, that, well, that's what I was going to say. That's that, would, f- that would suggest Indiana Jones is going to be in or definitely involved with this game in some way. So that's the first one. The second yeah. one is that there's a plane ticket to Rome on Indy's desk that's dated the 31st of October. Oh, Halloween, Matthew, I've just seen. Uh, 1937. So this would place the game after the first two films, but before the third one. And well before the fourth one, um, to to the the timing of that would match up with Benny Mussolini. So you know you would think maybe Nazis again. Uh, and three around this time, Mussolini was given the sword of Islam, which has led people to think like that will be the 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 Holy Grail or the Ark of the Covenant. Um, so prior to the two Lego Indiana Jones games in two thousand eight and or nine. The last Indiana Jones game of note on PC was Indiana Jones and the Emperor's Tomb in 2003. I didn't play it. Apparently it was all right. It was a Tomb Raider slash Uncharted-like. But yeah, apparently it was okay. But that leads me on to my very first question for you, Matthew Castle. Uh, What form does an Indiana Jones game take in 2021? Uh, I mean... This sounds really obvious, but like Tomb Raider, but fun. Um, Like, I feel like it would be okay for them to make a... So many games have have based themselves on Indiana Jones, the films. And what people seem to have added to it is either like the incredible angst and unpleasantness of Lara Croft's hardships or um, the kind of, uh, I guess, Uncharted, which is, you know, is Indiana Jones, but with uh, maybe a slightly more, I don't know, is it fair to say psychologically complex hero? I don't know. Nathan Drake's got a bit more of, like, a rogue. You know, he's more of a thief. You know, he's a than an archaeologist. It's true, yeah. He doesn't want to see it in a museum, I suppose, does he? Like, I yeah, feel like I Indiana guess, Jones has more of a, a respect for yeah, the I, I think that, and that's like a key, a key part of Indiana Jones for me is that um, he is, yeah, yeah, an adventurer, but comes from this academic background. I like that in all the films, it's basically his, like, knowledge of cultures that kind of saves the day or saves him. You know, it's, it's a sort of a sort of respect for these things and a respect for to history. A, to a degree, I would say. Like, you know, there are points. So I spent the weekend watching the three Indiana jo- the three Indiana Jones films yeah. uh, to refresh my memory. And because they're fun. Even Temple of Doom, I would say. Uh, it has a very good... I like the first and last half an hour. It's that middle hour that's a little bit meh. Um, but, uh, like, he is a... Uh, like as you say, like he uses his 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 knowledge of different cultures, and you know he has a respect for the the items and whatever else. But like there are you know buildings crumble and whatever because of what Indiana Jones does. Yeah, but, yeah, there is the, yeah, there, there is that. But I think I he means no, I well. Don't. He means well. Um, yeah, I often think in the thing like you know. So I've seen some people talk about this Indiana Jones game saying, like, it has to address that Indiana Jones is this, like, quite problematic figure. Uh, and I was watching... I, so I, I rewatched Temple of 
uh, Temple of Doom on Friday, actually. And which is like a famous, like famously um, maligned. Yeah, because of some of its dubious stuff with, you know, there's that infamous feast scene where they eat all these like, you know, chilled monkey brains and cockroaches and the but woman, uh, Willie, sort of basically, you know, being sick in the background. And, it, it, but like, in, in 2021, when you were watching that, did you not find, because I did, I was like, when they bring out the monkey brains, it just looks like jelly. It looks like strawberry jelly. And I was yeah, like... I don't think that's... I think the thing of, of, of like, all oh, these sort of foreigners I mean, yeah. with their weird foods, um, yeah. where actually throughout the film, Indiana Jones is basically there to say, like, don't fuss, you're disrespecting these people. You know, he speaks their language. He isn't, you know... I, I don't know. I find him quite respectful. Maybe I'm just like completely blind, some kind of extreme privilege here. But I, I, I think Indiana Jones himself is quite a quite a well-rounded, decent character. Um, uh, yeah, I think I think he means well, and he respects the main item that he's usually he going Nazis. after. And he does kill Nazis. He does Which kill like Nazis. The, basically, the best thing you can do on Earth. Is kill Nazis. <laughs> so, um, like, that's, I mean, that guarantees you a seat in heaven. You would um, imagine. You would imagine. It's the only murder that's allowed. But, um, but, but I, 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 so, have, I have gone for years thinking that Uncharted is, that, that's the Indiana Jones, uh, the video game. However, I probably, since I played the first Uncharted in 2007, eight, whenever that came out, like I haven't seen years since I've seen Indiana Jones. And I was reminded this weekend how much Indiana Jones uses, like he just uses his head. Like he's not, that's the another difference between him and Nathan Drake is that Nathan Drake, and it's the old joke, you know, he's the wise crack, cracking mass murderer. Like, yes, Indiana Jones does use a gun, there's the bit in the first, it happens in the first two films, doesn't it? The guy comes on, he's waving the sword around and Indy just takes the gun out and just shoots him. Like, he's not against it. But like, you think of the propeller death uh, in the the first film or even the, um, the steamroller thing in the second film. Uh, like, it's either Indiana Jones, yeah, using his his head to get around things or being lucky. Like, he's not yeah, really... I, I, I think a, a key part of it is like he is. I'm. Mean, he's obviously good at fighting, and he's 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 obviously you know quite athletic. But he is also like there's a hint of schlubbiness to him. Mm-hmm. He does luck out. You know, he kind of uh, turns the environment against people. A lot of people in those films sort of die not because of anything Indiana Jones does. Like the guy in Temple of Doom, he gets crunched by the big mind machine. That's just a that's just unluckiness with the scarf. Yeah, uh, that's that's not on indie. Um, I think uh, so. Whatever they do tonally, I, I I really hope it does lean into like the the sort of comedy chaos of it. I don't think the difference between Indiana Jones and Nathan Drake is body count. Indiana Jones does fight people, but he doesn't mow down like entire armies. That isn't his vibe, and I wouldn't want that to happen. You know, I'd hope that Agreed. they could lean more into exploration, puzzle solving. Action isn't fighting, but like chase sequences or rescue sequences. Stealth, even he spends a lot of time sneaking around in these things. There's a there's a lot of stuff that Indiana Jones does in the films, which is like non lethal. Um, I, the big question that hangs over this for me is that with this being machine games, is this going to be a first person or a third person game? Because this is a studio whose basically entire heritage is in first person, but I should also say, you know, they came, they formed from ex Starbreeze people who worked on the absolutely amazing uh, Chronicles of Riddick, ga- uh, the Riddick game, the um, was it Escape from Butcher Bay. Yeah. Um, first, which was one of the most successful attempts at capturing an action, a, 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 like a fist fighter in first person. You know, it had shooting in it, but it was a cinematic first person adventure. You sensed him, you know. You sensed, a, 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 you know, a physical body, a, a sort of presence there. It cut into first, into third person. I think when you were doing certain actions and things, you could see the character. I'd be really interested if they did something similar with that. You know, a bit of first person whipping. Well, whipping that's that, 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 that's bullet storm, isn't it? 
the, the, the first person whip game has already been made, but yeah, been but a bit, like, a bit yeah, cruder than what Indiana Jones is, I suppose. I, I'd be interested to see someone try and do like the Tomb Raider thing in first person. I th- you know, a first person game, which is as much first person exploration, platforming, puzzle solving as it is shooting, I think could be really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I just don't see this not being a first person game. Well, it, as you say, even given their pedigree, machine under the banner of machine games, it's Wolfenstein. Like that's and when it comes yeah. to Nazis, well, who better? You know, who better to take on the I mean, Nazis? Because they, like, they had some great Nazis in that. The guy with the milkshake. Uh, yeah, for, like Frau Engel. What a marvelous because it encapsulates everything that our media has um, shown us about Nazis, which is like. Obviously, horribly evil, but also quite camp and theatrical. Uh, and I would think they, uh, yeah. So, so you know, they're they're well qualified yeah. to to do that. But it is the uh, like Wolfenstein in terms of first person shooters. Like Wolfenstein isn't a even a Far Cry, for example, which is very bombastic. Um, load of shooty shooty bang bang, but also quite stealthy as well. Uh, you can you can uh, opt to play it stealthily. Whereas, yeah, Wolfenstein, it's all right. Okay, I'm being a bit unfair. There is a little bit of stealth, but it's predominantly I, I really explosive. Rate the stealthy Wolfenstein, it's quite vague. I think mm. you know, it's basically you can make stealthy inroads, but at some point it will become a firefight. Basically, yeah, yeah. Like, it's not like you can go in and take out an outpost type yeah. of thing being all I, stealthily. I, I, I'd, uh, I'd, uh, another thing I'd be quite interested to see them explore, um, one of my like favourite games growing up was Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. I was, which was just about to bring game. it up. I'm glad you played that because I haven't. And yeah, people really celebrate well, that. Like, What's great about that? So point and click game from LucasArts, very contradictory if you played Jim Monkey Islands or whatever, you'll know, you'll know all that. But what really marked it out is after a little prologue, the game basically, you could take three paths through the game. There was like the fists path, the brains path, and it was co-op. But I, don't think, I don't know if it was called co-op, but basically it was basically three games in one. You know, the brains path was just Indiana Jones by himself and had like the hardest puzzles just for him. Then there was the path where it was him and Sophia, who is like his sidekick in the game and sort of love interest. And then all the puzzles were kind of rebuilt around having two characters and having her to like distract people or whatever. And it was kind of the classic sort of, you know, indie plus love interest going on an adventure. Mm -hmm. And then there was the fist path, which actually had fewer uh, puzzles in it, but had like combat sequences. Not very good. I never really liked them. I never liked the fist path because it had like a, almost like a 2D boxing mini game where you'd fist fight by clicking on them. And I never really understood it or my mouse work wasn't as fast enough to do okay. it. It was a bit dubious, but they were basically three entire get, you know, they were, they were different. I think they even went to like different locations or maybe in different orders. Um, but that was, uh, that was absolutely rocking that game. Cause it kind of real, it recognized that there was a lot of different like strengths to Indiana Jones and there it kind of siphoned them into individual games, which is something they could do. I, I, I doubt they, they were, you know, just the work involved in making separate campaigns is a pain. But um, I'd love it if, very, if Machine Games were making an adventure game. I'd be, <laughs> be yeah, a little, a little different. <laughs> yeah. I, they, they, uh, I just think their tech and what they're set up to do and it's just made for first per. you know, they're a, it's quite hard for a studio to become a very, like just to do a different thing. You know, it, it, well, it not many studios have done that successfully. They literally just pivot and then they're like, you know, we did racing games and now we're doing first person shooters. Well. Criterion? <laughs> they did a black. Yeah. Like, yeah, but they, but, yeah, I'm, but to, to, to your point, yeah, it's not, it's not terribly common, I suppose. Yeah. But um, I just, I, I love that setting. It's, it's kind of actually similar to what we were talking about with IO and Hitman and Bond a few weeks ago. Like, Indiana Jones is a really cinematic world. Mm-hmm. Like it's not just, it's not gritty. I don't, you know, it's not gritty. It's not, it's not real. It, it looks like a film set and that kind of artificial big art design. I love that in games. You know, that's why I like the Hitman game. That's why I'm really excited about the Bond game. It's like, 
just really overblown location work. Um, that particular setting, the fact that it'll hope, you know, you'd imagine it would be globe trotting. Mm. Um, there's actually a very good Indiana Jones sort of Tomb Raider sort of type thing called uh, Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine, a kind of late 90s kind of Tomb Raider ripoff on PC, which was really, really good. And, you know, you went to this like Tibetan monastery and then you were in Egypt and there was a mine carts. You've got to have vehicle sections in it. There's always a good chase. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, the thing is, there's lots of sequences in down there in the existing films that you could just do as as quick, game sequences. Quick time events? Like, like, well, no, there... but like, like, I would love, to, you know, the whole save, like, Indiana Jones' dad from, like, the tank and you're riding yeah. a horse. That sequence is just, a, that is already a great video game sequence. Um, the mine, the minecart sequence in Temple of Doom is already a great video game sequence. Um, and what would be great is if they do their own story but had flashbacks to like key moments in the series. Imagine mm-hmm. like imagine if the game opened and you're literally on the bridge in the Temple of Doom and you've got the sword raised, oh, and you're and you're yelling out to short round like you know tie your leg to the thing in Chinese, and that was the opening of the game. Wouldn't that be great? That would be cool. That would be cool. I, 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 uh, I don't know. It's, um, I, I'm slightly worried that it will just be Uncharted slash Tomb I mean, Raider. Um, even if they do that, that's fine. Because Naughty Dog have, I think, even though, you know, that they, 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 they said they're not making any more Uncharted. It's not on PC. So, yeah. Also. True. That series, Uncharted 4, which I, I really loved, uh, you know, but was a quite a shift away in tone, I felt. Like, it got away from the fun of Uncharted 2, for sure, and it mm. suddenly became very, like, oh, I'm a bad man, I've got to atone for it all, and it just felt a little bit kind of... There was too much psychology to the character. Like, I it's f- okay for him just to go on a romp. I felt they had to nearly do that with Nathan Drake in that... Like if you look at as Indy's body count, like it 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 pales in comparison to Nathan Drake. Like yes, yeah. he has killed people, um, like, like but as I said, like twenty uh, people, yeah, you, probably, yeah, yeah, and a like, lot of them died in accidents chasing him. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's not his fault. <laughs> like, um, uh, so like, I don't want Indiana Jones to just become a a, um, a real cold callous murderer um or a wisecracking guy who also happens to kill loads of people um i don't know I, but i'm i'm very intrigued to see where this goes i am very excited oh, too. Uh, like for for my t- oh, I mean, this is just we are entering this like golden age of and and indie. Stuff i want to play i mean you know if you told me like a year ago there's going to be a new bond game from io a new Indiana Jones game, a new fable, I'd have been like, what? You know, like, these are just, like, tick, tick, tick. Mm. I am, like, this is this is all I want. Well, do you also want loads of new Star Wars games, Matthew? And in particular, a Star Wars open world game. Not from EA. So, on top of Indiana Jones... Lucasfilm Games, they didn't stop there. On Wednesday, it was announced via Wired that they were working with Ubisoft on this aforementioned open world Star Wars game that's being developed by Massive Entertainment, who are the people behind the the first and second division, and also the Avatar game. Do you remember that? If it ever comes out. Uh, This uh, game will use the Snowdrop engine, which is what they use for the Division 2. But that is pretty much all that's known at the minute. Like very, 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 very little. Now, uh, one of the more interesting things about this was that uh, I suppose everyone, you know, everyone was still in the mindset that EA would be making future Star Wars games. Like in 2013, EA signed a deal with Disney to exclusively produce Star Wars games for a decade. And this is obviously, they're they're letting it sunset, as it were. Um, however, Disney games boss Sean Shoptaw 
told Wired, quote, EA has been and will continue to be a very strategic and important partner for us now and going forward. But we did feel like there's room for others. So in eight years, what EA has produced with the Star Wars license is four games. Two Battlefronts, Jedi Fallen Order and Star Wars uh, Squadrons. And they've cancelled apparently at least three. Maybe more. <laughs> Who didn't knows? They a, didn't they do a VR game? Uh, oh, the death, uh, the the Darth Vader thing. Did that come out in the end? I didn't make Ranger note of that. Immortal. Who made that? Um, yeah, you, oh. I, I totally forgot that even existed. That was them, actually, wasn't it? So, okay, all right, maybe they made five games. Um, but before we talk and dissect EA's... Um, handling of the license. Is this new Star Wars open world video game from Massive Entertainment, the developers of The Division, is this just going to be Star Wars, or sorry, The Division, but with Star Wars characters? Is that is this a, a live service type game, do you think? I mean, live service perhaps, but not necessarily you know, division with Star Wars. Um, okay. I would say that, I mean, it, just off the top of my head, it's quite hard to vision the strengths of Star Wars are these quite kind of, you know, iconic weapons. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't really, like, it's, it's hard to see a world where you're <laughs> collecting, like, a thousand lightsabers and you've got a better lightsaber. You know what I mean? Uh, right. But are there not, like, are there not lightsabers that are better lightsabers? Are they, no, are they all this pretty much the same lightsaber? Yeah, I think it's more about, like, what you do with it, isn't it? Um, except for Darth Maul. He is the one that has the two bits jotting out, I suppose, isn't he? I don't know, my knowledge of <laughs> Star Wars isn't terrific. Um, uh, I... Well, it, it's it's very hard to to. I'm just trying to look up here about Vader Immortal and see who uh, did. That's not EA. I think it's an Oculus thing. I don't really know. Maybe. Oh, okay, right. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I don't necessarily. I see them just doing a big old, a big old loot thing. Um, I could hope they do something completely new with it. Um, because oh, I suppose I ask you that because like, could we be looking at a uh, a sort of a Marvel's Avengers type situation where everyone gets really excited about this thing and then when you actually see uh, the fruits of what they're working on you go, oh, I was hoping for this Star Wars adventure, this story that I would go on or like, you know, Star Wars GTA rather than Star Wars GTA Online. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, and obviously with so little known, it's difficult. I mean, mm. again, if we're going on like the whole machine games you know, doing what they know, you know, you'd think, okay, well, you know, at very basics, let's see, let's imagine a, a, a third person, a third person open world action game with multiplayer elements. I mean, I think the division is actually like pretty good. I know of, of all those service games, division two is like probably the one I played the most. I didn't play it a, a vast amount, but you know, I played it, enjoyed it. Um, I liked the world. Um, I like the locations. I like the missions des des designs. I thought they had a bit of sense of humor to them where they were sort of set in like weird locations around Washington. Um, it felt nice as a, as a sort of shooting game. Um, I just don't know if like as anyone's particular Star Wars fantasy is playing as someone who just shoots, uh, you know, in terms of like, you know, does anyone really want, you know, would you want to play Star Wars where you're just a, like a rebel trooper, you know, whatever they're called, right. the, the guys in the jumpsuits with just one of those laser pistols? Mm -hmm. You know, the fantasy is the lightsabers and force powers, which is obviously puts you maybe more in the, the, kind of like a destiny kind of space. Okay. Um, I mean, like, actually, now I say it, Outriders... Um, <laughs> our, game our, of the year 2021 game yeah. of the year 2021 has um, like you may as well be Jedi in that game 
And that plays well with like a little party of three because you're all zipping all over the place. Yeah, like Jedi powers instead of as your sort of special abilities. Mm. So, I mean, it, it, yeah, it's very hard. It's pure speculation. But, but like all we know is literally what we have, uh, what I've said, which is it's it's happening. Um, we didn't even get the kind of slightly fancier uh, Indiana Jones trailer. We didn't get a trailer that we kind of pick apart or whatever. Um, but you want something like big, sexy and new, really. I mean, you know, mm. Ubisoft, while they have the division, that is that has sort of been their big sort of service game. They've obviously got service elements and everything else, but they're still big believers in the massive single player open world game. Like they're totally. still doing them and they've got the production lines to do them as well. You know, you know, they've got Far Cry, Assassin's Creed, Watch Dogs. You know, they're doing a lot of that stuff. So there's absolutely no reason to, to you know, not do a big gallivanting around. Mm-hmm. I must admit, like, I'm not enough of a Star Wars fan to say, like, you know, oh, this world is where I'd want to go. I mean, if anything, I'd say one of the strengths of Star Wars is that they zip from planets to planet. Like, the idea of an open world, like, you're on this one planet. And they tend to be pretty uniform. You know, they tend to be like, it's a desert planet. It's a jungle planet. It's a watery planet. Um, you know, I wonder if we're still going to have a kind of galaxy hopping adventure. Hopping in some little vehicles and stuff. I don't mm. know. I, there's, there's just lots of open world stuff that's already happened and already in existence that if you just skinned it with Star Wars, it would kind of be exciting. Would it you know, be like, yeah? Would it be enough for Star Wars fans? You know, Maybe. Like, a, like, a far, like a Far Cry, but instead of jumping into a plane, a biplane, it's, uh, you know, an X-Wing or whatever. That's, that's, that's exciting. Mm. Um, people like all that stuff. People do like that stuff. Imagine so, yeah. the E3 demo and work back from that. Yeah. What are the big beats they want to show you in an E3 demo for a Star Wars game? It's, see that X-Wing, you can get in it, take off, fly around the level, and then land again, and people will go, woo! Yeah. It's, psh, lightsaber. Yep, people would lose their minds. Um, what, what did you uh, like? What, what do you think of EA's treatment of the license? Did they squeeze as much out of that Star Wars shit? No, they, they had some. Tr- I think they just had some like troubled stuff. I, I, I'm, I'm, it's a real shame that the um, oh, the, were they even called Visceral by the end? The studio that they were was still called on Visceral, the, weren't they? I think. Were they called they Visceral? Were. The, the mm-hmm. studio that was working on the was it called Project Ragtag or yeah. something? Which was the Amy Henning from Uncharted came over. The idea of someone doing like a proper third person romp with Star Wars characters in the Star Wars universe—that's exciting. That is still exciting to me. I would, I would play that game. I would play an Uncharted clone, which was Star Wars as hell. Um, there was third. Th- uh, 1313, wasn't that? I think that was under their watch. Was well, that, that was pre-EA. That was, that was when they were still well, That was game. pre-EA, that was you're right. That was, that was Lucas Games that then, the, the people who basically made Force Unleashed 1 and 2, that was going to be their next thing, mm. and the whole thing kind of shut down, and then it went to EA. Um, I think in terms of actual, like, like looking after the, the license and doing the world well, I think their games were, like, felt very, very authentic. Like, Whatever you think about um, Battlefront One and Two and the, the the various drama around the loot boxes and all that, like they were pretty stunning visually. Like, oh wow, like the you know it looked like Star Wars the way they they did all that photogrammetry on all the props and everything, so everything was exactly as it was. And the sound design and the music and you know I think they've been overshadowed by the first one maybe not being like the deepest game, the second one being marred with that loot. But now that that is sort of given the boot or the changes they've made, there are lots of people who swear by Battlefront 2 and say it's like ge- a genuinely amazing game. You know, I, I have friends who have played it for hundreds, if not thousands of hours and say it's like legit one of their favorite games of this generation because it's just wow. a great shooter and it has, um, you know, just amazing f- fan service. Like the, the, the recreation of the world is is so spot on that they're, they're completely whisked away. And I thought, I thought the same about Jedi Fallen Order. I thought that was great. Um, oh, I was a, a real treat. Um, Squadrons I haven't played, but yeah, like I think the things they actually put out, their Star Wars things haven't been bad at all. Um, you know, 
I, for all we know, making a Star Wars product is such a nightmare because of the license that Would you just be... get bogged down in shit, and that's what kills. That's what kills projects. You know, okay. maybe maybe they're just not very flexible and maneuverable as as games because everything has to go through. You exactly. Know, like you, you, you've when you're dealing with something a pre-existing property, and you just have to. Oh, do you know it'd be cool if in this level we had this happen? It's like, oh, hang on, we have to make a call to this person, to this person, to this. We have to go through all these hoops to then, I don't know, maybe it gets so bad that you're beaten down and you're just like, fuck it, we just won't do the cool thing that I thought of, and instead we'll do the things that we are, we know we're allowed to do. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Loads of film games coming out very... That's, it's interesting. Very, you know, very interesting. They were like, considered a a bad word in films for a long time. A bad word, you know, a bad name in games. Mm-hmm. Film tie-ins, bad rep. But... Uh, we dare yeah. to dream. We dare to yeah. dream. Uh, and... Uh, what's that coming up? It's the lovely right angle because last week CES happened and um, there, I don't know, there were some fridges and microwaves and all that announced. But also we got the announcement that NVIDIA is going to be releasing the RTX 3060. It's going to be coming in late February, costing $329. It'll come with 12 gigabytes of GDR6 VRAM, which is double the amount of VRAM available on the RTX 2060. And also the 3060 Ti and 3070, they come with just 8 gigabytes of GDDR6 uh, RAM as well, which is a quite curious thing. So, you know... I'm looking forward to trying to buy that and failing because I'm I'm sure that will happen. But February, obviously, Matthew, is the month of love. So what I want to know is, what is the the drink you love? The most? Yeah. Uh there's a there's a little cafe in town that does a uh, like a mint choc chip milkshake. You I, fancy bastard! I was expecting for you to just go cherry Pepsi, but like, that's okay. A, that's that's a, that's a real treat. Um, but yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Pepsi Max Cherry. I, I'm currently really into Seven Up Sugar Free in a big way. My favourite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love it's a, it. It's a, it's a superb, superb drink. You get all the joy of the full fat seven up, and like I, I can't tell the difference. I don't know. Are you one? Of the, can you tell the difference it's, between? I think it's sweeter. It's nicer. Mm. It tastes nicer than seven up. Little t- tip from the top there. All right. You know, don't be worrying about the full fat seven ups. Get on that seven up free. Mm, lovely. Show and tell. Show and tell. We can't afford. A proper jingle. Jingle. It's meant to be jingle. Yes, show and tell is the part of the PC Gaming Week spot where we tell you about the video games we've been playing over the last week. And this week, it's the video game. It's the video game of January, really, isn't it? Hitman (laughs) 3. Now, we spoke about this a little bit last week in broader terms and only discussing the first two levels, which you had played at the time, Matthew, I had played none. Now we come to you after Matthew's played the game, I believe, like, uh, uh, levels, like, you've, you've, maybe, have you rinsed it? Is it fair to say you've rinsed it? You've played a lot. Um, Yeah, I've played it, yeah, I've finished all the levels, and I've made a pretty good dent on mastery on most of mm, them. Very good. Uh, Now, I have, I've, I've only played through it, the once, um, so I won't be able to have the perspective that you do, Matthew. But Hitman Three, you know, broad terms, what did you think? I I really really like this. Um, as a fan of Hitman One and Two, uh, this was another set of cracking levels. I think it's pretty consistent across the board uh, for five levels. We'll get into the sixth in a bit. And, uh, like, I think there's a couple of new personal favorites in there. Um, but generally I thought across the board, they were, they were pretty great. Um, I thought there's some very subtle tweaks. I think the, like some of the big, uh, the mission stories, which are like some of the guided experiences have much juicier payoffs than they've had before. So it's, it's quite, um, 
there's some quite cinematic payoffs in some of the levels. Um, but you know, along with that, there's you know still tons of uh, like ingenious things to pick out and some really fun ways you can mess with the routines of the levels. I'm assuming most people are aware of Hitman and have played. Uh, I, I, I mean, let's, you know, I suppose maybe briefly break it down for the three people that don't. Yeah, so, um, yeah, basically uh, in Hitman you have levels, you're given targets, you have to assassinate them. It's a stealth game. If you go in and action heavy, guards will get alerted. They'll probably kill you pretty quickly. I mean, you're a pretty capable fighter, but it's not an action game and, and, and not really how you're meant to play it. You can do it, but it's, it's not satisfying. Um, but they are basically sandbox levels with lots of AI characters all walking about. You are trying to get access to, um, you know, your targets by stealing clothes, disguises to get you access to new areas. Um, also by like interacting with the environment and, um, sort of triggering things that might change your target's behavior. So if they spend their whole time in a busy party, you know, is there a way to call them to a secluded spot where you might be able to kill them? You know, is there a, can you do something elsewhere in the level that will kind of piss them off and, and get them to change their behavior and maybe give you a window of opportunity? So, um, yeah, it's, it's this big kind of a sort of AI stealth sandbox, um, out with a really pitch black sense of humor because it's fundamentally about, you know, murdering people in, in quite funny ways often. <laughs> it's basically just, um, but yeah. Hitman one and two both had, six levels a piece this has six levels they kind of run together it's weird like hitman 3 while a self-contained game with a self-contained story is is almost like a sort of a holding pen for all the if you own the previous games you can bring those levels into this too so hitman 3 ends up having all the levels and all your progress in all those levels kind of mixes to unlock things so it's this kind of grand sort of assassination sort of thing we, I think, uh, might have been last week when we were talking about Hitman 2 and maybe even this as well to a point. Um, do you think that this is probably the most expansion pack feeling Hitman or more expansion pack feeling than, say, Hitman 2? Because there are fewer sort of... Uh, I suppose there's fewer new things in this, like, you know, apart from the camera, which is... Yeah, there's so there's, there's there's fewer like new features. Also, there's not any extra modes where you know like two added the sniper assassin mode and which you know largely came alive in DLC. Um, but it added a multiplayer mode which wasn't very successful and mode isn't isn't in this. Um, this is just six levels. Just I mean they're massive and you're you know I, I've I've probably played this for about forty hours so far. Um, you know and I'm I'm. It's still got tons and tons to do. Um, but this really does, it is very focused on like V6 levels. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say what's new and maybe what stops it feeling like just six more levels is that it kind of ramps up the story a bit. There's been this story unfolding across the trilogy. And here, you know, it has, a, it kind of comes into the missions a bit more, whether that's in like cinematic openings, like playable openings to the levels, which are kind of just purely little narrative events or sort of things that end the levels on with like purely narrative things. So for example, I don't want to spot, I'm not going to spoil any of the mm. story beats, but there's one level where you have to assassinate two people. And then there is like a, a like a heist on a computer yeah. and an escape after you've done that heist, um, which is like a, a little sort of, uh, yeah, quite a cinematic kind of conclusion to that level. But then when you play the level a second time, um, you only have to kill the two targets. Like that cinematic thing, you can basically opt out of the cinematic intros and the cinematic outros, if that makes sense. Um, but the idea is that if you play it through, the, just if you play each level once, there's a bit more of a kind of a, a bigger story there. Um you know, the last level, actually the, the, the cinematic intro for the last level, which I won't spoil, I quite liked. Agreed. It, it, kind of, it kind of brought together 
the, all all three games in quite a quite a fun way. Um, it's no. not just cutscenes. There's like playable sort of not quick time events, but it's, I don't know what you'd really describe them as mm. sort of interactive cutscenes, I guess. But I I was glad when you told me that off um, Mike uh, because yeah I have only had time to kind of play through the levels once and um, some of the more kind of story driven bits haven't totally clicked with me um, like uh, I, I did there's um, I mean we can just get into the last level if you want uh, without kind of properly well, well, like, sp- well, sp- well yeah we won't we, not, not, not spoiling anything or the location or what it is but it's it's basically a corridor. Yes. Yeah. And it's basically a like a very quite a linear action sequence. Um which, you know, if you have any history with Hitman, even if it's the like the, the new Hitmans, they're very open, you know? They they are like the thing I love about Hitman is you're always at the beginning of levels given the solution, which is your target. Here are the 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 person or people you have to kill. No, hmm. they could be miles away, you know, because I think the first thing you do when you start a Hitman level is, um, it's called instinct, isn't it? Where you just hold the button and you're able to see their silhouette way off in the distance. So, you know, you always have that feeling where you go, oh, right, how am I going to get to them? And like that journey is like that to me, that's Hitman. Uh, that is figuring how to get there. That's, that's Hitman. Um, whereas, yeah, that last level is, it's, you don't really feel that because, as you say, it, Matthew, it's it's, it's a corridor. The, the, it's... Last, the last level feels like a Hitman Absolution level, mm-hmm. and Hitman Absolution, which I quite liked, but it, it's sort of slightly infamous. And it's basically like Hitman, the cinematic reboot, and it sort of forgot what was great about Hitman. Or it was still in there, but it was as interested in telling this big story with these big characters and. It, it wanted very cinematic framing for it all, and it basically turned the levels into quite linear journeys to do that. This game, for five levels, is not that. Big open world. I, there, there are sequences, like I said, the intros to some levels, the outros to some levels, feel a little bit Hitman Absolution in a bad way. But once you've completed a level once, you can basically opt out of those um, by choosing different starting locations and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but the last level is like, it's them saying this is the dramatic conclusion to that to our big hitman story where really the good hitman story or what i think most people enjoy is telling their own story in a sandbox you know the stories that are good in hitman are the hundred of hundreds of little dramas that are playing out in sandboxes and how you can interact with them and exploit them to kind of hurt other people um what happens between the missions in the in the kind of um you know the, the the actual sort of cinematics. Uh, like I I don't think it's particularly strong. I think it's quite sub James Bond. Um, a lot of the characters are quite unknowable, unlikable. I think there's way too many like secret organization names. Too much <laughs> jargon. Everyone's always like, "Oh, I am the pro- I am I am the Herald from Providence, and I'm here to find the Constant." And you're like, "What the fuck did you just say?" Like. Yeah. I, you know, hits with hammer instantly just to stop that bullshit from happening. I, I had that issue in the earlier games and I did here as well, where it's like, it feels like it shouldn't be that hard to follow, but it kind of, it, like, it there's just so many different terms being thrown at you. You're like, uh, what? What's, what's going on here? Yeah, it's... It is, it's really baffling because the actual writing in the levels is good. Like, when you're there... You observe the villains, and through the level, the villains basically introduce like what total shits they are. Like you'll see them being just awful to people, or you'll mm-hmm. find evidence of terrible things they've done. And by the time you actually get access to them, you're like, yeah, you know what? You deserve this. I'm after you. You know, they they are good at, and that's kind of a problem with Hitman. Is it's just a game about murdering a load of people, so it has to kind of make you feel a bit kind of good about that. Um, so I do think there is a tension between like I think IO still have this. Oh, one sec. Bless Sorry. you. Bless you. I think Io have this grand cinematic vision in their head 
but it kind of is counterintuitive to the actual what makes the game good. Um, it's why Bond is going to be interesting because actually that license does give you permission to lean into that mm-hmm. cinematic style a bit more. But here, here, you don't need to. And I would also say that here, like, it fundamentally doesn't derail the levels for me. And the levels are really strong. Um, like I said, there are a, a couple of absolute standout locations. I'm, I'm interested, Cullen, what, what was your sort of favourite? Um... I did really like, uh, I mean, we, we, we can't go into the actual, the sort of murder mystery aspect of the level, but I loved the second level, Dartmoor, which we did talk about last week, uh, and Chongqing. I really liked that too. Oh, um, um, but I, I suppose, right, do you know, I, I mentioned like the, yeah, the final level is, is very linear. Um, you have the murder mystery in the second level. There's something in the fourth, third level, third level as well, that sort of takes the uh, formula and changes it slightly. So like, I appreciate that they've tried certain things. I just don't think everything has hit. I think the murder mystery is a massive hit. Uh, it's not something you can repeat, but I think that like that was great. Uh, whereas there is a, I think I had more of an issue with the th- the way that uh, the thing that happens in the third level. Does not I have to forget about it because I have to jump through loads of hoops to try and say what it is without spoiling it. <laughs> uh, um, uh, but yeah, well, what yeah, what, what, I, what were your your favorites? Um, I, I I think I think the 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 level set in the. Is it Mendoza, the the vineyard? Mm. I think just I think it's an absolute classic. I like a beautiful location. I'm genuinely I think it's the best looking location in the whole series. Um, this absolutely just stunning vineyard, and there's like a big, almost like Godfather esque wedding on, and you you walk in with a tux, you get your invitation, you present your invitation, and just as you walk in, like this band strikes up. And these people start tangoing on the dance floor. And it just it is it's so atmospheric and cool. And it's this really good like the, the like fucking with the vineyard and the winemaking process is Yeah, that's there are, yeah. Some, there are some amazing assassination opportunities there. Some there's some there's a really funny one where you tour the vineyard and you can basically lure one of your targets over to various different machines in the winemaking thing. And it's just the button cues made me laugh because one was like, you know, like press this button to like, let's go and look at the grape crusher. And instantly your head's like, well, I know what's going to happen here. It's just got a, it's got a really good sense of humor. Um, I like the third level. I would say like what you're actually doing in there, but what makes it different, but it's this like nightclub in Berlin. Mm. And just as a location that captures like, the audio of what those places are like in a way you're outside and you can hear the kind Mm -hmm. of sort of thumping bass. And when you're in, it is so loud and intense and there's this huge crowd dancing on the dance floor. And it, it's like visually it's, it's absolutely amazing. I mean, it's a really cool location to look around and like, then you go outside and you almost feel that sense of like, Oh God, I'm out of that din. Just like you do when you're in a noisy, you know, when you come out of a concert or whatever and the toilets are disgusting. Yeah. It's just like graffiti everywhere, toilet paper, it just, you know, toilet seats missing, doors missing. It, their eye for what, like, makes a place a place is, is so spot on. And um, Like, I, 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 I think that there are some really, uh, like, a really quality, like, up the, within this World of Assassination trilogy, like, some, like, really terrific levels like I, I i really do um uh, i suppose yeah it is just it is disappointing when say like the final level does feel so disappointing because you're only dealing with six levels like you know um now these levels are to be replayed over and over and even you mentioned the nightclub level like you think of the locations in that you could uh, you could split them up into like you know one outside the nightclub two the nightclub itself three um the kind of base of the main gang there 
for the kind of like smoking room area. Like these levels are like even Chan King I mentioned. Like there's you you could really like um split these levels up into all these different kind of like mini locations. Yeah, yeah. Uh so like yeah, I I think like even though I say that about like say the last level, I think there are some like really top notch uh Yeah, yeah, notes. it's it's yeah, I, I'm not worried about like I'm. I, I give it a hearty recommendation in terms of like value. I think like if you're into Hitman, you won't feel like robbed of it. I, I'd say if you're maybe totally new to Hitman and you know you might play it and think you know if I was to play just one of the three games, like if I could only play just one, I would still probably play two. Um, because of the locations, because of the sniper, there's just a little bit more to it. Mm. Um. But this is this is I mean as a Hitman fan, it's I, I'd say they 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 are essential as a trilogy. Also on PC, I think if you buy Hitman three on Epic, you get the levels from Hitman one for free. It's yeah, it's there was out. over over the weekend there was some weirdness about that. Well, uh, but I, I think the the, the the final the final word is yes. I think yeah. You, you, well, the final word is if you own mm. one and two. On Steam, you you'll there will be some means to get access to those levels here without having to pay. But I think if you don't own one on Steam, you still get the levels from one for free if you buy oh, it. Oh, do you? Oh, yeah. I'm pretty sure that that was my reading of the things because it's just like everyone who buys it gets the Hitman One Game of the Year pass, which is like six levels, um, the tutorial level, which does come with Hitman Three as well. If you if you haven't bought that. Um, the DLC and everything, so there's you'll you'll be getting a decent chunk of game for your money on that. But Hitman Two is is my standalone favorite, I would say. Mm. Even though this has got probably like two of my favorite levels that they've done in it. Um, so so like ov- overall, as Mister Hitman, uh, very happy with Hitman Three. Ab- absolutely, yeah. and feeling even better about Bond because. This is, there's some levels in here which are just basically audition tapes for Bond. They aren't, like, this was already a series that was Bond as hell, but Hitman 3, the vineyard level particularly, it's got like, yeah. there's, there's, there's a, there's like a scene in a kind of villainous boardroom and just the setting of it, the, the monologue, everything about it, you are like, this could base, this dude could basically be Blofeld. Like, this could be an end level in a Bond game. In the Bond and game I, itself, yeah. Pointed, you know? Mm. Because the the way you kind of punch from this social space into this evil layer is just like, Mwah! and 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 the Chong King level as well. The the kind of ICA facility stuff in that is very like high tech Bond, but still could be a Bond level. Like and the music as well. Like when you walk into Chong King, you're walking on this like walkway into mm-hmm. the city, and there's always like choral. This is like choral version of like the Hitman theme and. Oh, they are, they are. It's good. Amazing. It is good. Yeah. <laughs> the art design and the, the, the set dressing and everything of these games is just like peerless, I think. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to diving back into those levels and kind of picking them apart. Um, because as I say, I've only played through them once. So there's loads of mission stories I haven't come across yet and everything else. So yeah, looking forward to playing more of that. Yes, Mystery Steam Reviews is the part of the PC Gaming Week spot where I, Colin Mahern, and he, Matthew Castle, test the knowledge of one another via Mystery Steam Reviews. Not regular Steam Reviews, that would be a little bit boring. Uh, if you're unaware, here are the, rev- the rules, not the reviews, the rules. Uh, so, both I and Matthew bring st- uh, three Steam Reviews to the MSR Arena, but we omit the name of the game associated with each review. Uh, our opponent must correctly guess the game attached to each review. One correct answer equals one point. While both of us have 90 seconds on each MSR, we both also have help in the form of three lifelines. These lifelines can be used at any stage during battle and also pause the 90 second timer. Each lifeline can only be used once and they are as follows. Question, where the hot seat haver gets to ask a yes or no question, second opinion, where a second review is given to the warm chair sitter and genre, where the genre of the game is revealed to the one with the warm arse. 
So because of Indiana Jones, mainly, and also Star Wars 2, this week's Mystery Steam Reviews centers on licensed video games based on pre-existing film properties. Simple enough, really. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's crack on then, Matthew, if that is all, all oh, clear. Excellent. Uh, so, here is your very no first. Shenanigans this week. No shenanigans. Not a single shenanigans. Yeah, exactly. All right. None of your fucking Command and Conquer. You got, a, you got away with murder with that Command and Conquer thing. Anyway, Matthew, here is your first Mystery Steam review. Got this game to play co op four player with three friends. I ran into two problems. One, one of my friends won't buy the game because of the negative reviews for it. And two, I don't have two other friends. That's from Aki. Uh, it is recommended 14.4 hours on record, 12.6 hours at time of review. Matthew, your time starts now. I got this game to play co-op four player with friends. I ran into two problems. There's negative reviews of it. Mm. Don't have two other friends. Mm. Four player with three friends. Oh, okay. Because them. Them, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so co-op games based on films. Um, you can... Oh, this is tricky. Because it's quite a limited pool of things, so I don't want to say loads of game names unless it triggers some inspiration for later answers uh, from you. Um, can I get oh, a genre we, for this? Okay, we're going to pause the timer at 42 seconds as Matthew enacts his genre lifeline. Okay, well, the genre of this video game is... I wrote it down here, where is it? Uh, the genre is a first-person shooter. A first-person shooter. The timer, which is at 42 seconds, is restarting now. A first-person shooter. Oh, shit. Um, <laughs> I thought, I was hoping you were going to say side-scrolling beat-em-up. I thought this was going to be a Scott Pilgrim. Um, but it is not. It's a first-person shooter. Games, military men, where you play as a squad. Uh, is that Predator game? They've been like aliens versus press colonial marines. Does Clon colonial marines have co op? It's Ten terrible. Seconds. Oh, god. I I'm gonna fuck it. Aliens, colonial marines. Is that your final answer? Yes, but I don't think it has co op. No, I said it. Shit. <laughs> Shit. So, got a, f a flash of inspiration there at the end, Matthew. Weren't entirely sure, was hoping I was going to say side-scrolling, you were going to go down Scott Pilgrim. But no, you've ended up on Aliens Colonial Marines. The review mentioned negative reviews. Aliens Colonial Marines, obviously. Quite negative reviews. Uh, but did it have co-op? I can tell you the correct answer is... Aliens Colonial Marines! Oh! I didn't think it had co-op. Oh well my done. God. Well done. Uh, so Matthew goes one nil oh, up. Oh my god! Did you ever play? Like it. Did you ever play it? Uh, I played like an hour of it. Did you think it was shit? Mm, yeah. Yeah, it's not great. Uh, Matthew, could I have my first mystery Steam review, please? The gameplay is also very well made and unique, leaning on the inherent slowness and clunkiness of men wearing all that heavy equipment to create a heavy emphasis on the dodge mechanic to avoid big hits. Sorry, it's a wordy one from Mercury. Recommended 7.7 .7 hours on record. Okay, time starts now. Oh, ha. Huh. Uh, wow. This is dodge mechanic. Why would they mention the dodge mechanic unless the dodge mechanic was famous for whatever reason? Uh, men wearing all that heavy equipment. Oh, I have no idea. I have aliens, colonial marines in my head. No, because of... <laughs> was there a famous dodge in that? Um, I am going to... 
I'm going to pause the timer at 55 seconds because, yeah, I'm lost. I have nothing. And, uh, uh, will I use my genre lifeline? Um, yeah, do you know what? Could I have my genre, please, Matthew? First person shooter. This is described as an action adventure game. Ooh. I'm, I'm going to say, though, I think Wikipedia is, has uh, shit the bed with this one. <laughs> okay, 55 seconds, timer restarting, no. No, it's sort of true. Um, an action adventure game, sort of, where there's a dodge mechanic and there's men wearing armour. Oh, Christ. <laughs> I have no clue. Um, I don't want to dump too... Although I think I'm going to have to ask for my second opinion because I can't even... Oh, what a useless use of genre. Um, uh, fuck it. I'm going to pause the timer at 17 seconds because I, I just I have nothing for you, Matthew. I have absolutely nothing. So, could I could I have my second opinion, please? Original cast and writers, it's everything an 80s kid could dream of and more. Um, an 80s film. Uh, okay, um, I'm going to restart the timer, 17 seconds. <sighs> Rambo the video game? That fair, I'm fairly sure that took lines just from the film, so it wasn't the cast per se. It's uh, all I have, Chris. Rambo the video game. Is that your final answer? That is indeed my final answer. So, you're puzzled by this one to the point that you've used two lifelines. You've used the genre, which told you it was an action adventure, and a second clue, which said the original cast of writers returned. And it's everything an '80s kid could dream of. You've gone for Rambo? But was it the favourite film of 80s kids? The correct answer is Ghostbusters the video game. Shit. Bustin makes you feel shit. <laughs> Who are you going to call? Not that second opinion, that's for sure. What was that second opinion again? Original cast and writers. It's everything uh, an 80s kid could dream of. Yeah. Wow. Mm, what a way... Right, this I think is gonna... describing it as an action adventure is a little rough. Like, if they'd said, like, third, third person... person. Yeah. Oh, well. I mean, Rambo's first person, so that was a shit guess anyway. Uh, Matthew, would you like your second mystery Steam review? War vet cusses at leaves and pets dog. And that... Ironically enough, is from Dr. Cat. It is not recommended and 5.0 hours on record. Your time, Matthew, starts now. Jesus. The hell is this? A war vet, Rambo? But he pets dogs. I don't think he pets a dog. I don't see that being an interaction that would be in that game. Give me the second oh, opinion. Okay, we're going to pause the timer at 1.14. And Matthew is going to use his second opinion. So the second opinion of this is... A perfect replica of the first movie. Especially when you get to the house. 10 out of 10 for fans. And your timer restarts now. First movie, you pet the dog and you go to a house. The house! The house. That isn't Rambo. Rambo doesn't go to a house. He just runs around a town shooting policemen. <laughs> That's not like... You don't go, Rambo, and they're like, I love the house. <laughs> the house. The first movie, so it's got to be part of a series. And you go to a house. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. And you pet a dog. First movie. He's a war vet. And he goes, he goes. 
are you laughing I'm just about? laughing at you repeating, he's a war vet, he pets a dog, he goes to the house. <laughs> he goes to the house. Like in the first film. Oh, the house. The iconic house. Where do you go? It's not The Shining. That's a famous house. Um... Oh, Ten fuck. seconds. Fuck me. Uh... Oh, piss. Oh, sh- Three seconds. Oh, fuck. I, I have no idea. I don't know. I can't. I can, literally can't think of anything where... If... He goes to a house in the first film. What the fuck is it? Okay, well, for we have to go through the official channels. Matthew... is incorrect. Um... The correct answer was Blair Witch. Oh no! Oh, the Blair Witch game, of course! He pets a fucking dog and he goes to the house! He goes to the house and oh. it had those fla- those shite flashback sequences. I didn't mind, I actually quite, I thought the Blair Witch game was alright, but like, some of it's obviously not great. Uh, the you know, and, and, and I, also, actually, I looked at that one yeah. and I went, nah. That's too easy. <laughs> and uh, you would forget that, like, I feel like most people do, Blair Witch, technically a film series. There are more than yeah. just the original game or original film. Uh, Matthew, could I have my second mystery Steam review, please? Yeah. You're able to play Steven Spielberg. He's throwing Oscars. 10 out of 10. Would throw again. Hey, if it's cares. Recommended. 32 hours on record. Time starts now. What? You're able to play Steven Spielberg. Play as him, play against him. He's throwing Oscars. So that, that should be play as him. Okay. Uh, thank you um, for being honest. Um, you're able to play as Steven Spielberg. He's throwing Oscars. Steven Spiel- What was that called? Steven Spielberg's the director's chair? <laughs> Um, is that on Steam? Uh, or th- was he involved in the movies? That wouldn't be a movie tie-in. That that's not a movie tie-in, correct, yes. Um, you're able to play a Steven Spielberg and it's a movie tie-in. He's throwing Oscars! <laughs> <laughs> All right, Steven Spielberg games that are films that were games. Uh, Jurassic World Evolution. Um, E.T. Back to the Future, the game, as in the Telltale thing. 15 seconds. Oh, oh God, I can't think of anything. Oh, no. Um, shit. Back to the Future is my final answer. <laughs> is that your final answer? Oh, fuck it all to hell, Chris, it is, yes. So, Back to the Future, indeed a game made of a Steven Spielberg produced film. Mm, Are you man. able to play a Steven Spielberg in Back to the Future? No. Throwing his Oscars. <laughs> the correct answer is... Lego Jurassic World. Shit. Shit. Forgot, <laughs> forgot about those fucking Lego games. Of course it's a Lego game. This <sighs> is a pretty devastating week for Mystery Steam Reviews. Yeah, it's not going great this week. It's not going great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Matthew, see if you can win us. Uh, go on, put the bullet in me. I um, intend to. Uh, here is your third and final mystery steam review. When I get to the part where Hulk has to transform to stop the giant tesseract worm, then it just stops and Hulk keeps winking at me. And it says I have to press H, but absolutely <laughs> nothing happens. If someone know the reason to this, please contact me in some way. Thank you. And that's from Mired, Meard. It is not recommended. 9.8 hours on record. 8.8 <laughs> hours a time of review. Matthew, your time starts now. <laughs> Why does Hulk keep winking? <laughs> <laughs> I 
Uh, question. Oh, okay. We're going to pause the timer there. Uh, right, Matthew, you want to use your question. Uh, fire away. What is your question? Can I ask, is this a Lego game? Yes. No, you're nah, you're saying you're answering can I ask if it's a Lego game? <laughs> uh, Are you saying yes I can ask or yes it's a Lego game? Yes. It is a Lego game. Oh your timer restarts. No. Now which one though? Because there were several. Lego Marvel's Avengers is my final answer. Is that your final answer? That's my final answer. <laughs> Matthew, your first thought was, why does Hulk keep winking at them? But your second thought was to use your question and ask if this was indeed a Lego game. It is. And you've given me Lego Marvel's Avengers. I can tell you, Matthew, that the correct answer is... Lego Marvel's Avengers. Son of a bitch. What a fucking legend! Because I genuinely did forget about Lego uh, for your second one for me. So then I was like, right, I'm going to have to really hammer home the fact that I forgot Lego was even a concept. But no, you had that question. Excellent use of question, Matthew. Absolutely top notch. Go on. We have to go through the formalities. Give me my third and final mystery Steam review, please. I didn't feel like the murder monster I was supposed to be. Too often, the best thing for the boogeyman to do was run away. Bogeyman, not boogeyman. Whatever. Mm. Cool, Jake. Not recommended. 6.8 hours on record. Uh, time starts now. Um, okay, let's try and get a consolation goal here. I didn't feel like the murder monster... Hitman. Um, a murder monster. So like a, a literal murder monster? Halloween. Uh, Friday the 13th. Just, yeah, like a, you don't play... Friday... How, you, you do play as... What's his job? Jason, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah. Friday the 13th, Chris. Why not, eh? Why not? I'm going to use that question. Fr all right. <laughs> Look, wait, all right. Okay. I'm going to pause the timer. Uh, going to use the question. Forgot I had it. Uh, is this a based on a horror film franchise? No. Oh, sh <laughs> <laughs> Okay, restart the timer now. What? <laughs> oh, dear. Um... It's not based on a horror. Oh, I'm lost. Uh. Unless it like, um, oh, Terminator? Is there a game where you play as the Terminator? What was the last Terminator game? Did they make one for like Genesis? Ah, uh, there was a Terminator game, wasn't there? Oh, I can't fucking remember what that was called. The, the, the Terminator... Uh, Genesis? I don't know. Is that your final answer? Sure. You've had a terrible run of it. You thought you had Friday the 13th, but then you used the question. Wisely, I should add, to identify it was not a horror film. You identified another famous murder monster, the Terminator. And you gave me Terminator Genesis as the name of that game. The correct answer is John Wick Hex. <sighs> Shit! <laughs> I thought you were going to get it because you said Hitman. Oh, yeah.
you were like hitman i was like oh shit and then you went down the horror route which is what i hoped you'd do <laughs> then you pulled yourself out of the horror route and i was like oh shit we're back in the hitman zone but you went for terminator <laughs> there was uh, i'm not going mad though there was a recent terminator game wasn't there i think yeah i don't know if it was on pc uh, maybe it wasn't oh who cares congratulations matthew <laughs> So, burning questions is the part of the PC Gaming Week Spot, where indeed we turn to you, lovely listener, viewer, consumer, for your feedback, your correspondence, indeed your burning questions. At any stage throughout the week, you can email us, weekspot at rockpapershotgun.com. And we may then read it out on the show. So, we have a few bits and pieces here, Matthew. Uh, Our first one of course, comes from Mog, who gave us a £10 super chat on YouTube when this the pre last week's episode premiered. Thank you very much, Mog. You are just brilliant. You are absolutely brilliant. Uh, Mog asks, when is the right time to stop saying Happy New Year to people? As always, really looking forward to the show. So when is, when is the right time, Matthew? When is it too late? I... I actually, st- I, I'm still saying it now in emails to people I haven't interacted with. Well, actually, I'm, I'm, I go for the more, I hope you're having a good new year. That's better. Rather yeah, because you can't, you can't say happy new year to somebody on the 18th of January. Happy <laughs> new year! And they're like, wow, are you still drunk? <laughs> it was a hell of a New Year's Eve party. Oh uh, my God, what day is it? Is it this 1st of January? Or, no, it's the 18th. Oh shit! Where have I been? I I do think that you're right. Like, if you haven't seen somebody since last year or spoken to somebody, you can say, hope the new year is treating you better than last year or whatever. Um, But yeah, actually saying the words happy new year. I don't know. A week? Maybe? Mm. Yeah, I wouldn't push it past a week. I think, yeah, past a week and people are going to go, you're a freak. What are you doing? Stop wishing me a happy new year, please. Uh, Paul got in touch. Paul asked, Hitman question as requested. If you could create a new Hitman level, what would it be? uh, And what interesting stuff would that level have in it? So make a Hitman level, Matthew. I would make a ski resort where there is a target at the top. There is a target at the bottom. It's connected with two chairlifts that pass each other. And you can travel in those chairlifts and do like a drive-by assassination when someone's coming down the other way. You could create an avalanche. You could ski down because there's all the snow underneath the chairlifts. Um, I think it would tick the kind of the industrial kind of behind the scenes of the chairlift, the kind of the the elite Alpine Lodge at the top. I think that would be superb for a this Hitman level. Sounds good. Uh, I would have... Has this been done? Um, a hitman level in a stadium where you have to shoot the manager of Manchester United. <laughs> um, be, like, basically, that bit in... Oh, that was such a cool bit in such an, a decent but not great game, Max Payne 3. Do you remember the bit where you go to the stadium? Oh, it was fantastic. Oh, a stadium with people in it. That would be Sta- good. Exactly. Stadium with, with people in it. And, and like dance around the side of a pitch to get closer. Yeah. And so sur- like your surrounding area, your, your chip vans and whatever else. Um, it's maybe a w. little close to Miami in Hitman 2. And the racetrack, true. True enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but it may- makes it more interesting if you have to kill Pep Guardiola or something. Yeah, be like you, can, you can take over as the bald referee and send characters off to set up new assassinations. Kalina. Maybe you could assassinate the manager and the star player. So you could go on as the bald referee. That guy. Oh, yep. Yeah. yeah, Kalina. That, that would be that would be good. What was his name? Kalina. Pierre Luigi Kalina. Um and you could score the winning goal. Ooh. Oh. You could go on as a player, make them lose so that the, the rival player storms off in a huff. That would be cool. I'm also envisioning like a mix between the bit in Max Payne 3 and also the episode, the Inside Number 9 episode that focuses on refs. I don't know how, but that. 
mixed together somehow. Uh, Ben also got in touch friend of the show, lovely Ben. Ben said, hello, uh, I've recently realised that I've got a whole lot of games where I get to the final boss and basically abandon it. Catherine Full Body, Hellblade, Moonlighter, Ashen, etc. I guess the logic is that I've already seen most of the game and if the ending takes 10 plus goes, my enthusiasm for seeing credits diminishes. Is this a me problem or a game design problem? Also, if Matthew wants to chat him, man, I guess this problem is analogous to escalations. Cheers, lads. Ben. Hmm. Is this a me problem or a game design problem? I mean, I've I've never had it where I've got to the end of a game and just sort, just, I don't know, just walked away unless, and I feel like we mentioned this l- last week or the week before, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. Like, yeah, I was that, just thinking that. That final I did, boss. I did finish it, but there, sometimes you're like, I have literally no idea how to get yeah. at this boss. And that's a fa- I would say that's a failure of game design. Like if, if you just can't identify it or it, you fluke your way through it, um, if it's just, if you know what you're meant to be doing and you can't just pull it off, I wouldn't say that's necessarily bad design, yeah. but it's it is hard. I, you know, it's 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 maybe it's there's an issue with hard. balancing in that, or, or yeah, but or, like there, there there've been very few games where I've just been like, this thing's actually broken. Do you ever play Castlevania: Lords of Shadow Two? I'd never got that f- that far into it, but yeah. Well, it wasn't it wasn't the end boss, but there's a bit where you had to sneak past this goat in this like there was like a stealth sequence where you had to walk through rustling leaves. And that I was like, do I actually know how to do this? Is this broken? Is this what's going on with right. this? And I did get through it eventually, but when I was reviewing that game, I had a real panic of like, what if this is it? What if I literally can't get past this section? What am I going to say? How can I possibly talk about this with any authority? Like, yeah. But yeah, I did it. It's, I'm a pro. It's um, like, like, like the, the guy in Metal Gear Rising. Uh, like I knew what I had to do. Like I didn't finish that. Um, because like, I just tried over and over and over again. And there were points where I got the health like really low and then I was killed. And I I was like, I know what to do. I am doing it. I'm just not doing it well enough or quickly or whatever. So fuck it. And it was just, oh, what a shiter that boss was. Mm. Um, Skinzy got in touch. Skinzy said, hi, a weak spot. Skinzy here to be your new favourite annoyance. Uh, Anyway, I have been poor pretty much my whole life, but now I have a tiny bit of spending money. So of course I will do the responsible thing. Buy video games. If you had three games and or series each that are must plays for someone not really into racing or fighting games, what would they be? Bonus points for deep sale prices because I am barely not poor. Love the show. Skinzy. Thank you very much, Skinzy. Um, uh, driving Forza Horizon but Four. Not, he said they're not really into racing or fighting games. Oh, so, uh, but I thought. Uh, oh, sorry, I thought they were asking well, somebody who's one, not. Hmm? I'd say Xbox Game Pass for PC. <laughs> I mean, it's literally. I mean, there's a great Forza in there. There's a great Giz. Gears of War in there, the Sea of the... Oh, there's loads of stuff in that. I'm confused by the question. Is it somebody who, like, point blank doesn't it's like, like racing like or fighting? Anything, or wants... But I'm not into racing or fighting games. Okay. Because I was like, is it somebody who's not really into it but wants to get into it? Yeah, all right. Okay. No racing it's or fighting. Not, it's not into, if you're not into racing games, Forza Horizon 4 will is, is about the best shot you've got of getting into them. And it's on Xbox Game Pass. <laughs> um... I know we've talked about it loads on this episode. Like, I actually think if you can get Hitman 3 and Hitman 1 free with it on PC, and if they then do it, because I think they're selling the Hitman 2 pass with like 80% off or something, so that'll be like a tenner. Admittedly, Hitman 3 is full price, but if you can get Hitman 3 plus Hitman 2 for a tenner and Hitman 1 for free, all those levels, that'd be pretty tasty. I mean, yeah. Xbox Game Pass is the answer because loads of video games. It's quite good. And I mean, if you want, maybe not, well, if you're looking to spend now, 
But like all those, like the Ubisoft One, Ubisoft Plus, maybe that's worth a look. Like all those subscription services, but like Xbox Game Pass. I do some free also. trials of those, see if any of them have got you. Like honestly, yeah. if, you, if you're trying right now to stretch money as far as possible, the subscription services kind of are the way to do it. Yeah. Because otherwise you're into the realms of like buy one game that might be, that you might, you know, it's much harder to say like this one game you'll play for like hundreds of hours. I mean, yeah. Yep. So sub- sub- subscription services there is the way to go. I'd also like hold on for the next, I'd definitely hold on for the next Steam sale or the Epic sales because they always give you like crazy vouchers for like, they gave you a tenner at Christmas or something, wasn't it? Yeah, like it's tenner, and then a lot of the games discounted to like five quid, so you can just get them for mm. free, basically. Um, sorry, it's a bit unhelpful. If you can come back, Skinzy, with a um, a more a more like, like what more specific like genre. tell us like your five favorite games that would yeah. probably help. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ricardo got in touch. Hello, Ricardo. Ricardo says hi. What? would be the best hidden co-op gems of 2020 for you guys. For me, it was Mudrunners, uh, even though it didn't release last year. The free game on Epic Store gave me that wonderful taste of the game. Then me and my friend got the game on Steam for better online experience and workshop maps or modes. Stay safe, everyone. Ricardo. Yes, important message from Ricardo at the end. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, Co-op game from 2020. Oh, I, I, I wish I'd done a bit more prepping for this now. As, as do I. I should have. Uh, I should have looked up 2020 co-op games. I'm trying to even remember what co-op games. Uh, I mean, one has popped up here. Actually, it's not a 2020 game. It's on Game Pass. Um, uh, but Among Us is. You know, I I spoke about it last week or the week before. Like, why it's not for me? I totally get. And like, if you have a large group of friends. I could see how, you know, that would be quite fun. Uh, Streets of Rage 4. Streets of Rage 4. It's a great show. Yeah. If you, you know, if you love the original Streets of Rage and Streets of Rage 4 is a, a terrific Streets of Rage. Um, so that's one. Uh, uh, I didn't really like Minecraft Dungeons enough. I didn't really play a lot of co-op games last year. Mm. Like, because I was being a bit antisocial as, 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 sort of stressed out. Um, I played a fair chunk of Hunt Showdown, oh, which yeah. I guess is co-op in that you play as a team against... I know there is PvP and PvE in there, but you do play with other people. It's not really a hidden gem. A lot of people know it's very good, but, like, you know... Yeah, we the, have given the, no hidden gems. <laughs> the friends that I have that are obsessed with anything are obsessed with Hunt Showdown at the moment. Um... um. But yeah, yeah Ho- hopefully there's know. a few there for you, Ricard. I don't think either of us played a lot of co-op games last year, no, really. No, I was feeling bad for social, just mm. sitting in lockdown playing a lot of single-player stuff. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, and Bobby asked, now this could be, this question could lead to a, either a very detailed, long answer or a very short, succinct answer. Uh, Bobby said, ever played Outcast? Brackets 1999, or its frustratingly lacklustre remake, Outcast Second Contact. Genuinely one of the most lasting and affecting games I've ever played. An amazing world, beautiful graphics, if your CPU was good enough in 1999, and a brilliant soundtrack. I've always been frustrated that it hasn't become the cult classic I'd hoped it would. Regardless, love the show, keep it up. Thanks very much, Bobby. Ever played Outcast? I have, and I really liked it. Um, I, never actually finished, I never actually finished it because I was quite shit at it. You basically, what was great about Outcast is you were dropped in this like alien world. You couldn't speak the language. It had some kind of mechanic for learning the language. Like maybe through talking to people, you worked out what certain words meant or you had to get a translation device or something. I mean, it, it's been, I, I literally haven't played it since, you know, for 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was kind of open world, free roaming, like, you were just kind of left to kind of tackle it as you want. And remember, it had this really like um, lumpy um, alien kind of like, uh, I think it opened in like, it's like almost like rice paddies, but it was very, uh, yeah, unique world. Like even in what followed, there's not really been anything which has kind of gone for the, you know, how do you deal with this, this mm-hmm. location, which is completely beyond you. And you just have to like find your own foothold and, I think you had to learn like what words meant so that people tell you like 
it's the temple to the north, but you had to work out what temple and north meant to get there and all this oh. kind of stuff. It was, it was I, I remember loving it, being quite bad at it. I haven't played the remake, though I interviewed the developers of it at Gamescom about four, five years ago. Um, and just being like, oh yeah, Outcast, I really like that. Um, and then that's the end of the anecdote. It's not my strongest anecdote, but no, I did but play you know Outcast. What? It rules. I, I, a stronger anecdote than you're giving yourself credit for because I I don't know, I was half expecting that conversation to be, uh, yeah, much, much shorter. Uh, no, so, um, yeah, if you want to get in touch with the PC Gaming Week spot and have any other classic video games you'd like me to ask Matthew to see if he played the classic video game, uh, email us weekspot at rockpapershotgun.com. And that... Just about does it for this episode of the PC Gaming Week Spot. Thank you very much, dear viewer, dear listener, dear consumer, for consuming. If you want more of us, there are ways that you can get that. So, you can follow us on social media. I am at Conor underscore Ahern. Matthew is at Mr. Basil Pesto. Uh, if you want to talk to some like-minded people, head over to Discord, discord.gg forward slash rock, paper, shotgun. Also, for the video version of this, Head over to YouTube and like, comment, subscribe, and ring the bell so you'll be notified of future episodes of this very week spot. But if you're more of an audio guy or gal, you can subscribe to the PC Gaming Week Spot podcast via all your podcatching apps, Stitcher, TuneIn, Apple, Spotify, etc., etc. Just search for us and you'll find us there. But for all of your PC gaming needs, head to rockpapershotgun.com. <laughs> Another PC Gaming Week spot down and uh, yeah, a more eventful week this week. Indiana Jones, Hitman, oh, God, whatever. Will next week bring Matthew A? Eh? Uh, very, very exciting. Probably nothing, indeed. Um, but now it is time for my least favourite part of the show. This is the part of the show must bid the listener, the viewer, the consumer adieu. So say goodbye, Matthew Castle. Goodbye. And say goodbye, Colin Mahern, Sloan. Go forward.